Hello, and welcome to episode 8 of the Dorothy L. Sayers podcast. I'm Lindsay Ann Scholl, and today we're going to talk about education. Seems appropriate, given that it's August and schools are starting back up again. COVID has not stopped education. It may have just pushed it into the virtual realm. In this episode, we learn some observations that Sayers makes about something so weighty as child development. As I told you, Sayers has something to say about everything, whether you agree with her or not. I also want to use this space to say thank you to my own academic community, Trinity Classical School in Houston, which has been like another family to me. I love them. And they've also taken Sayers suggestions pretty seriously. So let's get started. The title of today's talk is The Lost Tools of Learning, which, like so many of the other episodes, I stole from an essay slash lecture from Sayers. So what is it, or what are they, the lost tools? And what? Well, okay, so The Lost Tools of Learning was, singular, an essay published in 1947, which was based off of a lecture. In it, Sayers combines a medieval way of learning with a child's developmental stages. It sounds pretty ambitious, and she offers an immediate disclaimer. She says this, That I, whose experience of teaching is extremely limited, that's true, it was, and whose life of recent years has been almost wholly out of touch with educational circles, should presume to discuss education is a matter surely that calls for no apology. It is a kind of behavior to which the present climate of opinion is wholly favorable. Bishops air their opinions about economics, biologists, about metaphysics, celibates, about matrimony, matrimony, Inorganic chemists about theology, the most irrelevant people are appointed to highly technical ministries, and so on and so forth. Uh, Too much specialization is not a good thing. There's also one excellent reason why the veriest amateur may feel entitled to have an opinion about education. For if we are not all professional teachers, we have all, at some time or other, been taught. Even if we learnt nothing, perhaps in particular if we have learnt nothing, our contribution to the discussion may have potential value. So she starts out immediately diffusing the, why are you talking about this, Sayers? And it's true. She didn't have much experience in teaching at all. I think she taught maybe for like a year or two. It didn't really take, I don't think she had the patience for it. And uh, she went on to other things. But to be fair, Sayers isn't entirely unprepared to talk about education, particularly education in the medieval, in the Middle Ages, and even child development. As far as uh, the Middle Ages, she took her first class degree in Oxford in French, and she also studied quite a bit of French literature and medieval literature. She was an avid reader, both in classic and modern books, her entire life. She had a great facility for language. She had studied Latin. She knew German. She knew French. She translated the Song of Roland from medieval French into English. And of course, later on in her career, she would translate, you know, Dante from medieval Italian to, you know, English. She was a medievalist, but not likely a specialist in medieval pedagogy. And by pedagogy, you probably already know this, but pedagogy is just the um, the science of teaching. So if I say medieval pedagogy, it just means medieval ideas about teaching and practice of teaching. So she does have a pretty good, pretty good grasp on the Middle Ages as a whole and on the literature and other details of it. But again, medieval pedagogy, maybe not an expert in it. What on earth does she know about child development? Well, technically she was a mom. Well, not technically, she was a mom, but she didn't raise her child. So she didn't see that firsthand. She was a teacher, as I said, for a very short time. And she points out in her introduction that she was a student, that everybody has been taught. Okay, maybe not the strongest, uh, not even any record that she even really liked kids that much, but she talks a lot about kids in her literature. She also had a lot of friends. Uh, one of those friends, Dorothy Rowe, was entire, a teacher her entire career. Uh, I think it's Dorothy Rowe. Maybe it's Muriel St. Byrne. Mm. Okay, I'd have to check on that. But anyway, she had a friend, teacher her entire career. I think it was Muriel. Uh, another one of her friends, Karis Frankenberg, Frankenberg, was a pioneer in child development. And Sayers was in close contract with, contact with Frankenberg. I can't say it. I'm going to try that again. Sayers was in close contact with Frankenberg right before the publication of The Lost Tools of Learning. So it's possible that Sayers is being too demure when she says she knows very little about this. A couple other words on Frankenberg, just because I want to keep saying the name. Uh, She was the author of a very popular 
book, Common Sense in the Nursery. She was a daughter of the author of Common Sense in Education and Teaching. Uh, daughter, that, that was her dad who wrote that. She collaborated with Dorothy Rowe in a book called Latin with Laughter for the Children as a series. Uh, Frankenberg was also the director of a Green Gate, of the Green Gate Hospital, which was pretty revolutionary for its time. It aimed to treat rickets and also provided education for children. And it was a big institution. It changed gears a little bit during the war because it had to take kids, you know, out of it, it had to transfer to the country. Um, before the war, in 1920, Dr. Maria Montessori, if that name rings a bell, the Montessori schools, visited there to see the, sorry about that timer. We're just going to get that off here. She visited there to see how it operated. So Frankenberg was a big enough name to get other educational theorists to come by and see her. And Sayers went to school with Frankenberg. Um, and uh, she was in contact with her on and off, and especially right before the period of Lost Tools of Learning. So, and I'm responding to a couple articles to say, you know, what does she know about child development? It's true, she may not know much, but she may know more than she lets on as far as what she was able to pick up from casual conversation, letters exchanged, um, what her friends studied, she talked about. So I don't think it's fair to say that she had no, no evidence. Okay, let's go back to the actual article. In Lost Tools of Learning, she goes through kind of the medieval pedagogy and uh, the medieval pattern of education, which she breaks down using other, another breakdown. She didn't come up with this. You have the trivium and the quadrivium. Some of this is so familiar to you, you just could say this in your sleep, but maybe not everybody. Trivium is three disciplines, uh, grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Quadrivium is, oh gosh, um, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. And you know what? As I'm talking about that, I'm going to look that up right now because I teach at a classical school and I should know that. It's arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. All right, I was right. Yay. Um, good. I feel better about that. Okay, so she goes through, it's kind of a long essay. I'm not going to read it all to you, although maybe, hopefully there's some audio, you know, an audio version of it somewhere in the world. She talks about the medieval process of learning, how um, when they talked about, when they learned about grammar, it was Latin grammar. So it was, yes, you're learning how to learn, which is one of going to be one of her big distinctions, how to learn versus what to learn. And she ultimately comes down with a thesis that, we need to learn how to learn before we learn what to learn. So we end up with subjects first in our modern education. So I might learn about mm, the Roman Empire in first grade. But I don't know how I'm learning that. I just know that I know some dates and I know a little bit about the Roman Empire. And I, I, she's, we're starting with the subjects too early without giving, getting the tools of learning. The tools that, you know, it's kind of the whole idea of, you know, give a man a fish, he's for a day, teach a man a fish, he eats for a lifetime. So that's kind of what she's playing off of, although she doesn't actually use that metaphor. So children, she suggests, go through these different stages of learning, which are grammar, logic, and rhetoric. And grammar is the accumulation of data. I can just say dates. Normans conquered England in 1066. Um, Civil War, U.S. Civil War, 1861 to 1865. You know, it's just data. I don't have to know a thing about the U.S. Civil War to come up with those dates. And she says in this stage, when you're young, younger children really enjoy this. She calls it the pole parrot stage where people just kind of kids take in information and repeat it back. You know, they can sing a song several times over, and they don't care. They're just happy to keep doing it. They can watch a movie 47 times, and it's just beautiful to them. They're okay with repetition. They don't have to understand all the big themes or connect all the dots. She calls it the pole parrot stage, and it's aligned with the grammar stage. And she's kind of making two points about this. One is that we need to tackle the kids at their strengths. So when they're younger, taking in information is a strength for them. Maybe not understanding it, but taking it in. And she brings this up in her other letters and other dealings about, about children. Like she wrote that play for the Children's Hour for the BBC. 
And she just says, you know, the children just love the rumble and tumble of language. Uh, supercalifragilistic expialidocious. It's just fun to say. You don't have to know what it means. It may not mean anything, but it's just good to get your mouth around. And she says children are particularly good at appreciating this aesthetic. So why not take advantage of it? Why not give them a lot of information early on that they can memorize? Everybody knows that kids are better at memorizing information and better at learning foreign languages because uh, they can take in a lot more information than adults can. Okay, this is a poll parrot stage. And then you move on to the what she calls the pert stage, whose nuisance value, quote unquote, is extremely high. This is kind of the adolescent stage of learning. It's a dialectic. It's the asking um, why. It's the why, not just why, but connecting the dots. So if this is right, do you mean that this is right too? And this is a great time, she says, to teach formal logic, to teach the syllogism and what it means. that a So a syllogism is... Uh, th three statements, two premises, and one conclusion. Socrates is a man. All men are mortal. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. That's a syllogism. And she says the adolescent period is a great time to learn this because they like to argue. And they are actually pretty good at arguing. And this is when you want to, dialectic and logic are kind of the same thing. And she points out that in medieval education, that Diet that you would go through, you would, you would learn the material and then you would argue about it. And you better be good with your arguments because the people who are listening to you can poke holes in the arguments as part of their job is poke holes in your logic. If there's a logical fallacy, let's say that you committed, um, I'm, not, I'm not taking this from the essay, I'm doing the fallacy that I'm familiar with. So ad hominem, which is to the man. So uh, you say that I should vote for Senator Clarice Smith. I just made up that name. So I should vote for Clar Doc Senator Clarice Smith. And I said, I can't vote for Senator Clarice Smith. She has horrible fashion. Well, what does that have to do with uh, whether or not she's a good senator? It's not. It's just kind of a, a direct insult to her. Or if I say, I can't vote for Dr. Clarice Smith, you have horrible fashion. You have no idea what you're talking about. That's also an ad hominem. So part of the job of a dialectic is to present things in watertight logical formulae that are in, unassailable from a, just a formal logic position. So she says, while kids are feeling argumentative, mostly in the teenage years, especially like, mm, she says kind of up to 14, then take advantage of that, teach them how to argue. And then the poetic stage is the rhetoric stage when you are speaking and owning the material that's a poetic stage. Kids go through these stages naturally, she suggests. Why not tailor education? So when they're young, they're just taking in a lot of information. When they're kind of in the junior high years for us in America, give them the means to argue and also teach them how to connect the dots. Well, Norman's conquered England at the Battle of Hastings in 1066. Why did they do it? Why William the Conqueror, was that, was that good or bad that he did that? Um, get them to start reasoning the why and wherefore and the kind of the moral quality of these things. And then the poetic stage, own it. You know, be able to speak rhetoric, be able to speak eloquently about it. It's one thing to know the material. It's another thing to not be able to present it. So she suggests very generally that wouldn't it be great if there was a school that followed these medieval patterns of education. And then once all the children have gotten through these stages, then they can go on to the quadrivium and select their subjects and they can be more subject oriented. So by the time they've gone through grammar, logic and rhetoric stage and learning how to learn, then you can go on and pick a subject. And another aspect of this grammar, logic and rhetoric that she points out is that every subject has this. Every subject has a grammar of history where you just have to learn the dates, the characters, the names, the places. And then there's a logic. What's the connection between, uh, again, William the Conqueror and Hastings? Why did he land in Hastings? Um, what was he doing? What was his point? And then there's a rhetoric of me trying to tell you about the Battle of Hastings and why that's essential and helpful. Every, every um, We know this anytime we learn something new. Let's try you're trying to learn a, a foreign language. You need to learn the vocabulary. You need to learn the grammar rules. Grammar Vocabulary is definitely grammar. Grammar rules are also grammar. 
um, putting together a sentence, logic, dialectic, um, and then poetic is, um, you know, being able to speak fluency in that language. That's just one small example. Every subject has, you need to memorize this stuff, you need to connect the dots, and you need to represent it. I mean, every subject has that. That's the essay in a nutshell, in a big kind of clunky, ugly nutshell. I would suggest you read it. You can find it as a PDF on the Association of Classical Christian Schools website. You just type in Lost Tools of Learning PDF, and uh, you can read it yourself. And I highly recommend that you do. So sh this essay, what do I want to do next? I, wa I want us to think about if you're in classical education, you know this essay fairly well. And in fact, in the in the world of classical education, it's produced a small storm. In the 1990s, Doug Wilson, an educator, pastor out of Idaho, um, used this essay to kind of formulate, kind of reviv revivify the classical movement and not just teach classical things like great books, Latin, Greek, but to reorient how we do pedagogy reorient how we do education along the lines of Sayers. And that movement, I mean, I'm a result of that movement because I get to teach at a school that does that. And several schools throughout America and beyond follow this, not just the content as far as teaching classics, but also this is how you teach the classics, grammar, logic, and rhetoric, these stages. In fact, the school where I teach, the elementary school is called grammar, the kind of junior high is called logic, and the high school is called rhetoric. So we're taking it pretty seriously. But like any great movement or significant movement, it has its detractors and has caused a small storm, I think, you know, fairly recently among classical educators themselves. Uh, let's see, I've got an article in front of me here that's sponsored by or written by, um, posted by Searcy Institute, which is also a classical education institute, August 9th, 2019. Sean Barnett wrote, Dorothy Sayers was wrong the trivium and child development. And he kind of goes through and talks about, look, this ed medieval education was not this simplified. It didn't exactly work this way. They didn't consider that every subject had grammar, logic, and rhetoric. And he's probably right. I don't I don't know all the details of it. I imagine if Sayers put her mind to it, she could probably come up with a decent response. Um, but yes, it is a highly a high simplification of medieval pedagogy. And by the way, the word medieval itself is a simplification because it's talking about talking about a period of about a thousand years throughout Europe and beyond. So it's just a word to use medieval. I mean, it's already, we're already on dangerous territory. But so, so there has its detractors. And there are classical schools out there that don't follow, they talk about classic books, they talk about Latin and they're great schools, but they don't follow the grammar, logic, rhetoric, pedagogy of teaching kids or teaching subjects. Another author and write, another speaker, Chris Schlecht, um, he's out of Idaho. Um, also, he he kind of points out in a recent webca webcast I heard from him that Sayers, what Sayers was trying to do, and I think this is something we have to remember, those of you who are familiar with the essay, Lost Tools of Learning, she, this was just a small part of her overall career. Now, I would say she lived out this. I mean, if we want to take as a model for how to learn great literature, Sayers is a great model as a person to do, to, to follow. But this is just a small element. I mean, she she wrote, she she had this letter exchange where she talks about the trivium and the quadrivium She with M.L. Jacks, who was the head of the Department of Education at Oxford University. So she has this little exchange and then Jack says, hey, that's kind of cool. Why don't you come talk to us at a vacation course in education held in Oxford in 1947? And she says, great. And then she says to her publishers, hey, I gave this lecture. What do you think? Good little pamphlet. And the publisher says, yeah, let's do it as a pamphlet. And that in England was really about it. You know, her career that we talked about and all the other aspects is just such a small element. And the way, when you read her letters, you can see that she's thinking of it as, you know, she calls it a little bit hobby, little hobby horse. Um, I'm glad you like my little outburst about the trivium. It was given to school teachers, seemed to cheer them up quite a lot, and has since sold well as a pamphlet. That was to talk uh, to Dr. Helmut Kuhn. Um, <laughs> in 1950, she was actually invited to found a school. Can you imagine? Anyway, so in America, and this was in America, she was invited to found a school in America. 
And so the Americans actually seem to be taken a little bit more seriously than the British. And that's still the case today. The classical education, neoclassical education movement is definitely significant in America. Uh, maybe not so much in England. So that is the essay in kind of its place in Sayer's entire career. Now, she had other thoughts on education, maybe not on formal education and actual classroom pedagogy, but kind of how to learn. She did have some other thoughts. She has a couple of essays on how to teach Latin, and that could be another subject by itself because she does, she promotes kind of conversational Latin, and also that maybe we shouldn't be re reading Virgil. Maybe we should be reading some of the medieval stuff because the medieval stuff is more accessible to people who are learning Latin and it doesn't go through all the verbal gymnastics that Virgil, the poet, does. So she's got some great things to say about that. I just want to conclude today by sharing two of Sayer's thoughts on education. One of them, and these are not represented in Lost Tools of Learning, They're sh they show up elsewhere. One of them is represented in a letter in that from 1945 where the guy from, okay, I got his name right here. Just wait for it. I've got the bookmark. I'm ready to go. Okay. Is this my bookmark? No, I can't find. Where is it? Page 138. Why did I mark this other thing? I'm probably going to regret that. Okay. I'm here. I'm really here. Page 138 of this. Now, where did it go? Volume 3? I'm looking at volume 3. Am I looking at volume three? No, I'm looking at volume four. Okay, once again, patience is greatly appreciated. Please hold. Here we go. To Dr. or to Mr. John Hadfield of the National Book League, who had asked her to write a list of her favorite books and so it could be published. And she says, No, no, I will not do that. Because what good would it do to publish those unclassified omnium gathering lists of titles? It can only encourage a habit of randomness and the sentimental cult of the personal touch. Besides, what are one's favorite books? Those that one rereads every time one has influenza, um, those that are uh, press one's critical judgment, those which has found, one has found important late in life. What do, you, what do you mean by favorite books? And she says, you don't need a bunch of book lists. You don't need what I think is good for children to read. And uh, she says, I may merely put the young persons off some masterpiece forever by wishing in on them at an unsuitable moment. What they need to be taught is how to read. You can see the echoes of the lost tools, tools of learning here, how to learn, and then you can figure out what to learn and how to follow up their reading, not to skim through lists of other people's choices all anyhow, but having found an author or a subject which interests them to pursue that interest till it opens up the whole connected and articulated structure of literature. I've seen this happen several times in myself. I've seen it happen with my husband, John, he developed an interest in Michelangelo a couple years ago, and he just started reading. He realized that Michelangelo wrote poetry, so he got a book of Michelangelo's poetry, started reading it. He wanted to learn more about Michelangelo's life, so he got a biography of Michelangelo. And then he wanted to so see what other people thought about Michelangelo's life, so he got some scholarly things about Michelangelo's life. And so he followed these steps because he was interested in it. And Sayers lays out the steps that maybe one should want to follow if you want to pursue a subject. She says, this one, and this is good. Take notes. One, read other books by the same author. Two, read books by that author's contemporaries. Three, read books about his period. Four, read books of and about the period before him, basically what he developed out of. Five, read books of and about the period following him. So what sort of development did he set in place? And six, read the standard literary criticism about him which may be read at the same time as the above, only make sure it's standard and not freak criticism. So she lays out these six step steps, which sound like a lot, but they're actually, they're just natural. Because when you're interested in a subject, as I have been with Sayers, it's, oh, like, well, I like her short stories. Oh, wait, she wrote this other stuff too? I wonder what biographers say about Sayers. You know, where did, you know, Sayers like G.K. Chesterton, what did he say? And you just kind of naturally follow, it's a natural course of inquiry. Anyway, it's a little unorthodox because she doesn't like book lists and she doesn't like saying what her favorite books are. And she gets a little bit also unorthodox about what to assign people. Like uh, she, in another letter, she talks about how I don't want to ruin. Maybe kids aren't kids aren't ready for the classics yet. Some of them, it'll just ruin them if they get them too early. Another, and I'm going to close on this. Another charming little example of 
ideal learning conditions is from volume four. And this is what I have bookmarked in a letter to Barbara Reynolds, 1956. And she says this. Okay. Um, she's talking about, oh gosh. Well, how to learn. I think leisure is one of the answers. Mental leisure or leisure, if I'm British. No examinations to get through. Quiet, well-organized households full of books. Long evenings when people read aloud and discuss, read aloud and discuss what they read. And now when I come to think of it, all those old-fashioned instructive books that we snigger over nowadays were full of intelligent, if slightly priggish, children asking questions. Pray, Papa, says little Harry. Why has my pretty silver egg spoon turned this ugly yellow color? Because, replies Papa, the yolk of the egg contains a substance called sulfur, which etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Is sulfur bad for me, Papa? On the contrary, my dear, sulfur has certain excellent medicinal properties, such as etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Why then, chimes in Mary, if I were to take plenty of sulfur, I should have a pretty complexion like Mama's. Yes, indeed, and there are a number of places where people go to enjoy the benefit of warm sulfur springs which issue from the ground, etc. etc. Are there many such medicinal springs, Papa? To be sure there are, and some of the most various kinds. At Bath, which is now called Aquae Sulis by the Romans, etc., etc. Oh, Papa, I did not know the Romans ever took baths. Did you not, my dear Mary? Well, I am sure Harry can tell you all about it for in our last history lesson, etc., etc. And so it goes on a little ramblingly, ramblingly perhaps, but so compellingly that you can never see an egg spoon without remembering it. I think this is the type of childhood she had. You know, just kind of the parents like learning. They have something to talk about. They have something to bring to the table. They get books around. They kind of re refer to things. Uh, you know, the egg spoon raised the sulfur. You get the idea. Anyway, that's from her letters, and I just love quoting her letters. Okay, I think that we will stop right there. Thank you all for listening to this perspective on education. Feel free to email me your thoughts at Lindsay Ann Scholl, that's Ann with an E, at gmail.com. I'd love to hear your thoughts, particularly if you have some expertise in education or experience in education, which according to Sayers, we all do. Pax Fobiscum, peace be with you. <laughs>